My name is uh, Brian Blackwood. I'm part of Boulder Center for Orthopedics. Uh, a little bit about myself and my background. I grew up in uh, Montana and went to a small college called Carroll College in Helena, Montana. Uh, played football there. Uh, and then went to medical school at the University of Washington out in Seattle. Uh, and then an orthopedic residency at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Uh, and then did a fellowship in hip and knee replacement at the Kuhn Joint Replacement Institute in St. Helena, California, uh, where I became the first surgeon with fellowship training specifically in robotic assisted joint replacement under the guidance of Dr. Tom Kuhn and Adam Friedhan. Uh, moved to Colorado almost a decade ago now, nine years uh, in two weeks. Um, I have medical licenses in Colorado and Montana, uh, and I'm a consultant for Stryker uh, Orthopedics in the Robotics Division. Uh, what that means is I actually educate other surgeons on how to use the technology that we're going to discuss tonight um, and sort of help to spread uh, the good news of robotic arm-assisted joint surgery. Deep ties to Boulder County. Uh, this is my grandfather and me hiding behind a cow. Uh, this is Boulder County Fair around 1990. Uh, we won a blue ribbon for showing cattle. Uh, my grandfather was a dentist up in Longmont uh, and had a, after he retired, had a hobby farm uh, on 40 acres with a head of cattle. And this was one of our summer projects was to uh, show the cattle here. Um, that, came down during the summers and worked on the farm, loading up hay, um, and even made the front page of the Times call uh, 30 plus years ago. Um, you can see my interest from orthopedics arising from my crooked knees if you look behind the cow. This is what everybody's most interested in, is the updated pictures of the kids and family. Uh, yes, uh, my wife works with me. She's a wonderful person. We have five children running around at home, uh, punctuated by almost three-year-old twins uh, at the bottom of the pictures there. Well, my practice at Boulder Center for Orthopedics, um, I do exclusively hip and knee replacements uh, with a focus on minimally invasive surgical techniques combined with advanced technology. We try to do 99% of our cases that are done under span spinal anesthesia. Um, our length of stay for a total knee is uh, one day, as same as it is for total hips. And actually, we're having more and more patients go home the same day from surgery, uh, from both the surgery center and from the hospital. Uh, 91 plus percent of our patients are discharged directly to home without patient physical therapy, so they don't have to go to an inpatient rehab or to a uh, skilled nursing facility. Uh, and like I mentioned, we're doing these uh, outpatient at the surgery center and at the hospital so that patients can recover uh, in the comfort of their own home that evening. We at the Boulder Center for Orthopedics have the lowest complication rate of the medical facilities in Boulder. Um, there was a misspeak earlier. Um, I am no longer Boulder's only uh, fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon. Uh, we have a new uh, hire, Dr. Eric Bowman, who has also done a fellowship training in uh, hip and knee replacements. Uh, but I am the first in Boulder uh, who have fellowship training in this level. Um, we feel that the fellowship training that we have at the Boulder Center for Orthopedics uh, really helps to raise our quality of care. Um, and we're very focused on providing top-notch care to the community of Boulder and Boulder County and beyond. I want to start at the beginning of what the most common reason for hip and knee pain is, um, and that is arthritis. But, but what is arthritis and, and why does it cause problems and, and cause this pain and discomfort? In general, if you look on the screen uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a very nice, white, shiny uh, cartilage-ended bone. So the cartilage caps the end of the bone. It's a very low friction uh, surface. Uh, there's no pain fibers in cartilage. Uh, but as that cartilage tends to degrade away or wear away for some reason, it exposes the bone underneath, which creates a lot of pain, inflammation, swelling uh, from the bones rubbing against each other. And there's a lot of pain fibers in bone, uh, and that causes discomfort over time. There's two main types of arthritis. Osteoarthritis, which is the wearing out of the articular cartilage. So that's where the nice, white, shiny cartilage I just showed you is, is worn away and exposes that bone underneath. That's by far the most common type of arthritis, affecting greater than 90% of the patients that we see. There's also inflammatory arthritis, which is more of a systemic process. So this is more when the body turns against itself and starts to attack the normal cells in the hips, knees, um, and really joints around the body. Uh, examples of this most common is rheumatoid arthritis, uh, psoriatic arthritis. There's other more rare things like ankylosing spondylitis. Um, but this is usually very well treated with medications at this point, and so we see fewer and fewer patients who have this type of arthritis, although it does still end uh, in joint replacement in some instances. There's an x-ray showing what this bone-on-bone -bone arthritis means. So the knee here on the left-hand side of the screen has no space between it. 
Um, the knee on the right has good space between the bones. We'd like to take our x-ray standing uh, with your knees straight and slightly, slightly flexed uh, to show us the arthritis that may be hidden throughout the knee. Um, sometimes patients can have a little bit of cartilage in the front of their knee, and so just a standing straight x-ray um, hides the severity of their arthritis, uh, which is most manifest in a flexion view like we see here. There can be big bone spurs um, and cysts that can form in the bone, and this is when fluid leaks into the bone and creates a little cavity um, as more of a sign of the arthritis. Bone spurs themselves don't usually hurt, but soft tissue going over the bone spurs can cause some discomfort, um, and we try to remove all this when we do do knee replacement surgery. It doesn't have to be that severe. It can just be isolated to the inside part of the knee uh, or the outside part of the knee or even just under the kneecap. In the hip, the same idea occurs, although in the hip there's a little bit of a sneaky attack of the arthritis. The, knee will, the hip will often become stiff before it becomes painful. So as that cartilage wears off the end of the bone here on this ball and you expose the bone underneath, the capsule tends to thicken around to try to reduce the motion of the joint, to try to reduce the pain and discomfort that you have. And so your first symptom rather than pain may be difficulty with trimming toenails, difficulty putting shoes and socks on. Um, in addition, hips tend to wear out a lot faster than knees, um, and so sometimes they need to be addressed in a more urgent manner. This is a pretty severe arthritis. This patient's right hip looks very good over here on the right-hand side of the screen. On the left, you can see there's severe degradation of the bone, giant bone spurs that have formed, and no space between the bones here. So all that cartilage is worn away, uh, leaving a very worn out, painful arthritic hip. There are a lot of other causes of hip pain. The hip is sort of a nebulous area. It's actually more centered in the groin where that ball and cup is on the x-ray, uh, but you can get pain on the outside of your hip. This can be worse when you lay on that side, if you sleep on that side. It can come on rather acutely, um, and usually this is treated best with anti-inflammatories, sometimes an injection and some physical therapy and stretching. Back pain can radiate down to the hips and cause some confusing symptoms. Um, you can also have back pain with hip arthritis, unfortunately. Um, and so we really try to do a good physical exam and get x-rays to differentiate from the cause of the, the symptoms and pain. And also, this groin pain that you get from hip arthritis can mimic a hernia, or a hernia can mimic this hip pain that you get. And that's when there's an abdominal opening in the groin area that causes pain when there's pressure put across there. The number of patients having needing hip and knee replacements is drastically increasing as the baby boomers age. Uh, they did a study um, 10, year, 10, 15 years ago now uh, showing the projections for hip and knee replacement needed uh, in the next 15 to 20 years. Um, and it's predicted to dramatically increase, especially in knee replacements as we move forward. Uh, hip replacements are also projected to increase. Uh, and if you want a trivia question, uh, Boulder County actually has the highest per capita hip replacements uh, in the country, and that data is from before I moved here, um, so that's not my fault. Patients are better educated at this point. Um, they're getting a more and more information. Uh, patients are both younger and older. Uh, we do hip and knee replacements in patients in their 90s. We do them in, in teenagers, uh, unfortunately, on rare occasions. Um, and so they have different sets of expectations. They want to maintain their quality of life and their active lifestyles. Uh, people want to get back to skiing, back to hiking. Um, they want more demand on their joints and just to walk down and get the mail uh, from, the, from the mailbox. And so they're better informed. They're educating themselves on the internet. They're attending lectures like the one we have tonight, uh, talking to their friends and getting good information that way. Internet is a great access for information. You just want to be kind of double check and, and look for the source of the information. Uh, there's no quality control on there, so you want to be aware of the internet and, and discuss the findings that you have with your doctor um, and also be aware of uh, things that sound too good to be true, like stem cells, uh, peptides, amniotic fluid, a lot of these other sort of experimental procedures. Um, while I do do a lot of joint replacement surgery, my first uh, goal is always to help you avoid or delay a joint replacement, and so that's a good place to start here today. There's a lot of non-operative treatment options for hip and knee pain. Rest, ice, and heat can be very helpful. So if you just take some time off from uh, exercising the joint, um, if you place a little ice, a little heat application, sometimes that can work wonders for a, a little bit of a pain in the hip and knee. Medications for inflammation and pain can be very effective. Uh, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Aleve, those kind of things can be very helpful. It's very surprising to me how many patients come to me and don't 
want to take those medications, um, but would rather have a surgery. And then they show up for surgery after we sort of have them take an anti-inflammatory the night before, and they find out that it doesn't hurt nearly as bad as they thought it did. So some of this over-the-counter medication can be very helpful. You want to take it in, you know, small doses and not max out the dose on the bottle and take it for a short period of time, but it can be a very effective treatment in the short term. Lifestyle modification is important, so avoiding high impact activities. Uh, we kind of frown on running and jumping, uh, but we do want you to be active, but in a joint healthy way. So if that's swimming, biking, uh, walking, those kind of things. Physical therapy can be helpful in maintaining the strength and motion around the joints, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't do a lot to prevent the continued degradation of the cartilage. Joint fluid supplements can be helpful in a, in a short term um, and helpful to help prolong the time to needing surgery. Uh, knee arthroscopy uh, and hip arthroscopy are really don't have great indications in arthritis patients. Uh, they actually have done studies where they did a knee arthroscopy on a patient at the VA and then pretended to do a knee arthroscopy because the idea used to be you could kind of clean it up or try to buy some time. And they found out that those patients were both groups were at the same at two years. So um, we really moved away from doing knee arthroscopy to kind of clean things up or try to buy some time. If there's a symptomatic loose body or an acute meniscus tear, uh, those are well treated with a knee arthroscopy even if there's a little bit of arthritis. Uh, but often if the arthritis is bad enough, it's better just to, to undergo a, a more invasive surgery than a knee arthroscopy, unfortunately. And then joint replacement we'll talk extensively about as we move through the, the program. These are guidelines for non-surgical management of knee arthritis from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Um, one of the big ones is initially weight loss, so you want to try to keep the weight off the joint. Every pound you lose is five to seven pounds off the joint itself, um, so it's a good bang for the buck that way. Uh, and generally, we try to recommend patients lose about 5% of their body weight um, when they come in. Uh, sometimes that can be difficult if the arthritis is bad enough and it really limits your mobility. Exercise and physical therapy uh, can be helpful. Um, aquatic therapy can be helpful to offload the joint as you're trying to do exercise and uh, lose weight. Oral medications, like I mentioned, the, the anti-inflammatory medications, um, as Tylenol, uh, ibuprofen, Aleve, those kind of things, some topical capsaicin, there's topical Voltaren gel, um, even some uh, you know, tram tramadol can be helpful in some instances. And we really try to avoid opioids, though. So you want to try to avoid narcotic pain medicine for joint pain because it really isn't very effective and um, people can become very dependent on that uh, and it can really cause a lot of difficulty at the time of surgery as far as treating your pain after a surgery. Injections, um, steroid injections, uh, Play the rich plasma injections are a little bit inconclusive. Um, we usually like to start with a cortisone injection because it helps decrease the pain and inflammation in the joint. There is a lot of sort of rumor and innuendo and old wives tales around that you can only have three cortisone injections in your life. That is not true. Um, you try to spread them out and use them, use the injections judiciously. Um, but, and we try not to do it in people who don't have bad arthritis so that we don't damage the cartilage uh, inside the joint with those injections. Um, alternatively, you know, there are hyaluronic acid injections, which are vial, uh, gel injections that are supposed to recoat the joint like an oil change in the knee. Uh, our academy actually recommends against using these hyaluronic acid injections, and many uh, insurers are actually starting to stop paying for these uh, injections as well. So um, in some patients, it does seem to work, and on an individual basis, it may be beneficial to you, but on our larger population-based studies, um, you know, they're not as effective. And so we try to reserve those for people who either don't have bad enough arthritis on x-ray, um, and so they have more cartilage where that hyaluronic acid seems to be most effective, or if they really don't want to have surgery or aren't great health candidates for surgery, um, then we try those hyaluronic acid injections to try to help them delay the need for surgery or, or prevent them from having surgery. So again, lots of options for um, over-the-counter medications. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is glucosamine and chondroitin. That's a very popular supplement that people take for joint health. Um, and individual patients seem to get some benefit from this, but again, on population-based studies, there's not a lot of great data supporting um, the use of glucosamine and chondroitin. So if you are trying it and you're wondering if it works, I'd recommend stopping for a period of time um, and see if you notice any difference. Um, if you don't, then you're probably not, probably not getting much uh, relief from that medication. Again, keeping your goal body mass index or BMI below 40 uh, is very helpful to offload the joints. Um, that helps to 
prolong the joint. It also helps for safety at the, around the time of surgery. Uh, so we've looked at studies that have shown that a BMI above 40 increases your risk for blood clots, infections, pneumonias, complications around the time of surgery. And so if we can, we really try to encourage patients to, to lose weight to get below that number. And again, avoiding those high impact activities like running or jumping. But we do want you to be active. It's a little counterintuitive, but if you actually use the joint walking, uh, riding a bike, uh, swimming, doing water therapy, um, it actually helps to, to prolong the life of the joint itself. Joint injections, we talked a little bit about cortisone. Um, we'll get more into visco supplementation, platelet-rich plasma or PRP, uh, and stem cell options that are out there uh, as we live very close to the, the epicenter of stem cell uh, usage in the, in the country uh, just north of Regenix uh, in Broomfield. Hyaluronic acid injections or visco supplementation, gel shots, sometimes called chicken shots because the first iteration was actually made from the, the comb of the chicken over here. Um, so I took the, the fluid out from there and purified it. Um, it is covered by most insurances in knees, but it's covered by no insurances for hips. Um, it is starting to become less popular and, and there are some data coming out that it's a little less effective as, than we would like. Um, and so be careful in using these. Um, if it works well for you um, and your insurance is covering it, I think it's, it's reasonable to continue doing those. Um, if you want to try everything short of surgery, I think it's a, a reasonable option. Um, but this is not going to regrow the cartilage. It's not going to be a long-term cure uh, for those uh, arthritic knees. PRP or platelet-rich plasma. Uh, the idea here is to actually draw blood from you, uh, concentrate it down, and then inject it back into the, to the area of uh, the joint to promote healing and, and slow the progression of the arthritis. Uh, play the rich plasma actually is fairly effective and pretty true, proven in soft tissue injuries. So in hamstring uh, injuries and tennis elbow, um, sometimes in the rotator cuff, it can be helpful. Uh, there's some equivocal data and questionable studies um, showing some improvement in knee uh, pain that's similar to cortisone. Uh, but this is not covered by insurance and can be relatively expensive in the five to $600 range. Um, so just have a good discussion with your doctor before proceeding with this because there can be some pros and cons. Um, again, it's not going to heal your arthritis. It's not going to regrow the cartilage, uh, but it may be beneficial to de decrease some pain and inflammation for a period of time. And then the promise of stem cells. So the idea here is that uh, Stem cells are obtained from the body, uh, concentrated and then injected back into the joint to decrease inflammation and promote healing. Um, this is not covered by insurance and can be very expensive in the five, 10, even $20,000 range. Um, to be clear, there actually has been a lot of discussion about this in orthopedic literature lately. Um, you, if you are getting stem cells, make sure that they are your own stem cells. It is actually illegal for them to take stem cells from other sources and inject them uh, into your joints. Um, so be careful about that. Uh, the people at Regenix say that orthopedic surgeons and particularly joint replacement surgeons are going to be pushed to the dustbin of history. Um, so I'm curious if this is what my future looks like. Uh, so I decided to look into the, the data that they have uh, supporting uh, stem cells at the Regenix Institute itself, uh, comparing what they have for hip and knee replacement, um, hip and knee injections, comparing it to hip and knee replacement. So this is knee replacement, total knee arthroplasty on the left, and BMAC bone marrow aspirate concentrate group on the right. Uh, these are knee society scores. These scores are out of 100. Um, and so pre-procedure uh, for the total knee arthroplasty group, they were at a 48, so pretty significant dysfunction. Uh, for the stem cell group, it was at uh, 69. After surgery, the knee society scores improved to 80, uh, which is a pretty good improvement. Uh, and after the stem cells, it went from 69 to 82 uh, in the stem cell group. And if you look at it, you would say, well, 82 is bigger than 80, so it must be better. Um, but you got to remember where you started from. So uh, there's a 32-point increase on a total knee arthroplasty patient and a 13-point increase on a stem cell patient. And we expect total knee replacements to last 20 to 30 years at this point in time. Uh, and there's no long-term data on how long a stem cell injection lasts. I think the current uh, things that they tell you at the stem cell institutes is it may help for six to 12 months um, if it works for you. How does it work in hips? Uh, so hips, total hip arthroplasty, THA, uh, versus bone marrow aspirate concentrate. This Harris hip score is similar to the Knee Society score where it's out of 100, 100 being the best. Again, hip injection patients were at 60, about 69 and improved to about 82, whereas the total hip patients were much worse at 56 and improved to 94. 
Um, this is one of the best surgeries that we have in modern medicine is a hip replacement. Um, and so I think this is pretty definitive evidence from the Regenex website that shows that uh, hip replacement is better than stem cells uh, in um, all cases here. So I sort of liken stem cells to snake oil. Um, I do think that research into stem cells is still important and can be very beneficial. Um, but uh, there's a little snake oil and salesmanship that goes into this. Uh, so what some people don't know is that snake oil actually worked, um, but it had nothing to do with the snakes. Uh, there was some capsaicin powder that they put in there, and that has some anti-inflammatory effects. Um, and so that helped with uh, some of the pain relief. Um, but right now, I think that uh, the stem cells need more research. There's a lot of promise, but not much performance. Um, and so be careful uh, trying to dole out a lot of money uh, to these institutions, because I don't think there's a lot of performance that, that backs them up. So in general, I think there may be future for stem cells in many applications of medicine. Uh, but I do not think preventing joint replacement or regrowing cartilage inside a, a patient's hip or knee is going to be one of those things. I understand that thinking about surgery is a difficult decision, uh, but there are consequences of delaying the surgery. Uh, osteoarthritis is a degenerative disease that's going to continue getting worse over time. Uh, and patients who've been recommended to have surgery have better outcomes if they have surgery sooner than if they wait uh, longer. So I actually had patients who elected to have surgery when told to, and then patients who waited for two years and compared the groups. The patients who had surgery sooner had improved function and reduced pain. I think this was more from you know, not digging yourself such a big hole, so the patients had a little bit easier recovery. Um, they weren't so debilitated, uh, and then they weren't two years older as well. There's a lot of new opportunities and improvements in arthroplasty and joint replacement. Um, we've made drastic improvements in the materials that we use with success rates of 90% uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, we have different alternatives to address knee pain with partial and total knee replacements, minimally invasive procedures, so we're damaging less of the soft tissue as we're going through these uh, surgeries. Uh, and new designs for the implants. We're now having more implants where the, the bone grows on uh, to the implant, and we don't have to worry about cement potentially failing in a knee replacement. Uh, so a lot of very exciting advances in surgery. One of the most exciting is the uh, Mako uh, robotic arm system. Uh, I've been using this for more than a decade now. It was a big part of my fellowship in California. Uh, we brought this to Colorado, uh, to Boulder itself. Um, this is a computer-navigated, robotic-arm-assisted uh, joint replacement system. Uh, works on partial knees, total knees, total hips. Um, we got the first system in Boulder nine years ago. Uh, two years ago, we got a system at the surgery center. Uh, and then at the end of last year, we actually got a second uh, system at the hospital because the demand uh, for use of the robot and access for um, surgeons was so uh, impressive that um, you know, we really want to make sure that people have all the access uh, to this technology as they can. The idea with uh, robotic arm surgery started with partial knee replacements, and so it was addressing early arthritis. Um, this is where the damage and arthritis was isolated to one compartment of the knee. 90 plus percent of the time, that's on the medial side or the inside. Uh, it can also be on the lateral side or just under the kneecap. And the idea was to take a surgery that is very technically demanding and make it very reproducible and consistent. And so we're able to just replace the inside part of the knee or the outside part of the knee or under the kneecap. Uh, the idea with this is like the dentist where we go in and do a drill of filling uh, rather than doing a whole crown or root canal. So we'd be more selective about the arthritic pain uh, and the part of the knee that has worn out. Here's what this looks like just under the kneecap. Um, we also put a little plastic button under the kneecap itself um, to get rid of the arthritis if it's isolated in there. We also can do this in the two-thirds of the knee. Um, this is a very uh, narrow indication for this, but if patients are younger and um, want to maintain the majority of their knee, uh, we can actually uh, bone conserve and do a combination of the two where we do the inside and under the kneecap. Um, this is how this procedure works, uh, this makoplasty idea. Uh, the patient has to have the correct indications, so you need to have arthritis in the correct area. It needs to hurt you in the right area when we do the physical exam. Uh, and then you need to have x-rays that match up to the same. So uh, you need to have you know, isolated disease to a single compartment. Um, if you meet those indications, uh, we then get a CT scan uh, from the hip down to the ankle and make an actual 3D model of your knee on the computer. So we're actually tracing the CT scan and making this model. We can then use that model to plan for the placement of our components. Uh, we plan to a tenth of a degree and a tenth of a millimeter. Um, we're actually able to see the results uh, of this plan on the screen before we do any committing to cuts or any um, surgery at this time. Uh, we then 
get you back into the operating room um, after you get that spinal anesthetic. Um, we prep and drape and get everything ready for the surgery. Uh, we then put pins into the, the thigh bone and shin bone so that we can actually track the knee in space in real time. Uh, we find the center of the hip so that we can go from the center of the hip and then make that line up with the center of the knee and the center of the ankle. We go through and uh, roughly register the, the bone for the, on the patient's own bone and then match that up to the CT scan. We could then confirm our registration, um, and you can see all this on the, the computer screen in front of you. Uh, and so we combine that with the CT scan and the pre-op plan. We still haven't committed anything at this point, so we've really kind of matched and uh, mirrored the patient's real knee with the CT scan. And then we can make adjustments on the computer and see how those adjustments affect the patient's knee so we can virtually perform the surgery before we've actually performed the surgery so we can optimize the outcomes after the surgery. So we can optimize our implant tracking. Uh, we can actually cartilage map to make sure we have a nice smooth transition from uh, bone to remaining cartilage. Uh, we can test our uh, range of motion and really balance the ligaments very well so we can adjust the position of where those components need to be uh, for each individual patient. So um, I like to call it an infinitely personalized process because we have total control over where we're putting those uh, implants during the time of surgery uh, so we can make adjustments based on the information we get during the surgery, uh, which includes soft tissue information and, and the alignment of the limb. We then can do this through a minimal incision where we uh, burrow away the bone uh, to create a bed for the metal parts to go in. Um, this is a very safe procedure, so it actually creates a room where the robotic arm will not turn on unless it's inside the specific area. And then you get this, what we call, haptive feedback that increases, so it makes you stay inside the lines and not go outside of the planned resection. So we don't take excess bone, we don't cut soft tissue that we don't uh, intend to. Uh, it makes it very safe and, and reproducible. That's what this looks like on the screen. So we create that bed, cement in the, the metal part, so we get rid of that hard arthritic bone and replace the bearing surface with metal and plastic. That's what it looks like on x-ray, so we take the the preoperative arthritic bone here where they're bone on bone and then replace that with metal and plastic. Uh, in doing so, we also take this from bow-legged to mostly straight, um, but we do the, try to undercorrect a little bit um, so we're not perfectly straight in line. Uh, we're cheating it toward the inside of the knee so it's wearing more on the plastic rather than on the outside of the knee. We can do this on the inside of the knee, the outside of the knee, just under the kneecap, or like I mentioned, a combination of the two. Uh, it's a less invasive, more accurate, very reproducible procedure um, that allows us to conserve bone. So if we do have to come back and, and do a second surgery down the line uh, where we convert you from a partial knee to a total knee, which hopefully is 15 to 20 years down the road, um, we have a lot of bone to work with to do that. Luckily, it rarely does that occur, um, but we are not perfect. We're having done hundreds of these, there's a handful of patients that have had to have a, a second surgery, um, but in general, people do very well with this. This is holding out in larger center multi-system studies as well, um, showing the, they actually did a randomized control trial with a robotic arm-assisted partial knee uh, versus a manual uh, partial knee and found that there was almost double the number of patients who had excellent knee society scores at three months, um, which is a very good improvement, a very rapid recovery. They also found that these patients had less pain after surgery um, than the patients who had a manual knee much quicker. Uh, satisfaction much higher um, in these patients, so 90% uh, uh, plus satisfaction. Again, not perfect, but you know, we're trying to get patients uh, as satisfied as we can. Um, and that stays throughout the five-year data as well. Revision rate, um, showing how quickly these need to be done. There again seems to be a, a trend that people are worried or concerned about a partial knee, uh, that they might have to go back shortly thereafter and have it redone. This is often due to manual instrumentation and uh, surgeon error that occurs at the time of the surgery. Um, and so what we found is if we use the robotic arm for this robotic partial knee, uh, we're actually to cut that uh, revision rate by almost 80% from 5% down to 1.2%. Um, that was actually a study done with my mentor, Dr. Tom Kuhn, uh, in California at a multi-center study, uh, showing a very low revision rate at two years. Uh, and then that's actually carried on now for 10 years out on this data, um, showing again the same 1% revision rate, so not perfect, but about as close as we can get with this procedure at this time. What if you need to have more than just a partial knee? What if your knee is too far gone for partial and you need to have a total knee? Um, luckily, we were the first center in Colorado to perform a MAKO total knee, um, and we've been doing this for five, almost six years now, and patients have been very happy with the outcomes. The difference with a total knee from a partial knee is we actually resurface the entire end of the femur or thigh bone, uh, as well as the top of the shin bone. 
Um, we put metal parts on those, cobalt chrome on the femur side and titanium on the tibial side, and then a plastic liner in between. Uh, we then resurface the, the kneecap with uh, plastic if indicated, um, although there are some studies out there showing that we may not need to do that uh, in the future moving forward. Again, taking this nice normal knee uh, with the nice bright white articular cartilage, um, unfortunately the, it is worn out over time and exposes the bone underneath. It's worn out on both the inside and the outside of the knee, um, and so we need to go in and do a total knee replacement. Uh, and so we replace the ends of the bone uh, with this metal and plastic. We are not going in and cutting the knee uh, here uh, and here at the, the thigh bone and shin bone and putting in an entirely big giant um, implant. Uh, there's a lot of misconception that that's what's going on. We're really just trying to resurface the ends of those bones to get rid of that arthritic surface and, and change the bearing surface that we have in the joint. That's what it looks like on x-ray. So again, a nice normal knee joint over here. This person does not need to have surgery. Um, the bone on bone here, so you can see that space is left. Um, a deformity of the knee with some bow-legged uh, alignment or varus alignment as we call it in medicine. And then we go in and replace that um, with metal and plastic. So we resurface the end of the bone um, and then put a little plastic liner in between. And a little plastic button under the kneecap. There is some variability with manual instrumentation. So this is the more traditional way to do this. Um, it's been going on since the 70s. Um, and it's relatively accurate as far as making the bone cuts, but it doesn't take any soft tissue information into um, effect. And it, you know, while we have as accurate a cuts as we can make with manual instrumentation, um, we don't have uh, the checks to make sure that they're as accurate as they can be. Um, and so this can move some patients to be unsatisfied with their knee replacement. So this is where we have a disconnect between survivorship of total knee replacements, which is 99% um, at 10 years, uh, to only 80% of patients are satisfied in nationwide studies. I think each individual surgeon probably thinks that there's a little bit better, um, but there's obviously some that, that aren't happy after they have their knee replaced. Um, I like to think that mine's a little higher, but you know, I still think there's room for improvement. We all want to be perfect um, and have that the perfect patient outcome for all of our patients. That's what, we're, that's what our goal is. So I think this is a good way to help us do that with this Mako total knee. So again, we get that CT scan uh, of the knee before surgery, make a 3D model of the knee so we can size and position which implants that we want before the time of the surgery. Um, we're able to take off the shelf components and fit them exactly where they need to fit on, your, on this individual patient. Uh, there's eight different sizes and I haven't come across anybody who doesn't fit in one of those eight sizes through thousands of knee replacements. Uh, we get patients back, open up the knee joint and place some trackers into the bone and then go through that registration process that's very similar to the partial knee um, so that we can confirm the patient's real bone onto the CT scan. And then this is the exciting part, we actually take the knee through a range of motion and assess the gap balance and alignment um, and see if we can make some fine tune adjustments to the position of those components in real time um, so we can balance the knee before we make any cuts um, and really sort of optimize the component position for patients um, so there's less soft tissue um, damage and less soft tissue releases that need to be done and a better balanced, uh, more stable knee uh, when they're done with surgery. And then the robotic arm allows us to execute that plan very precisely and accurately as well as increase safety features from that haptic guidance. So here's a little close up view of that. So um, we're able to take off and plan um, seeing all the information that we can get directly from the, the screen here. Um, we're trying to replace the ends of the bone with metal and plastic, and so we want to make sure that we have the right size that's going to fit on each individual patient. Um, we can actually bring up real CT views on here and see how this implant compares to the patient's normal knee. Um, and so it gives us a lot of information to size and get the correct size for each individual patient. Um, we then place the arrays and map out the, the patient's individual knees. And we verify that. So this helps to eliminate what we like to call garbage in or garbage out, which was an issue with just regular computer-guided knees or image-less navigation knees. This is image-guided, so we're confirming off the CT scan, uh, which adds a layer of uh, accuracy um, and safety for the patients. Then we're going to joint balance. So we're actually going to take the knees through a range of motion. And our goal is to get spaces on both the inside and outside of the knee at 18 uh, or 19 or, or sort of whatever that personal uh, surgeon's goal is for the space in the, in the knee joint. And we can make sure that it's balanced in both flexion and extension, balanced both medially and laterally throughout their arc of motion um, in order to make sure the patients have a stable knee that's not tight. 
once we have the components on the computer system uh, aligned the way that we want, um, we actually bring in the robotic arm and it creates a little safety zone and allows us to, to cut the bone um, directly from the, the robotic arm. So we move around. Um, this increases our accuracy and safety uh, for the patients as we make these bone cuts. Um, and then we move to the, the final cut off the, the tibia. Um, this helps us from cutting unwanted uh, soft tissue or damaging any tissue that, that inadvertently that can occur with manual instrumentation. Uh, and early results support this. So this was a study comparing uh, 30 total knees with manual instrumentation and 30 total knees with robotic arm uh, instrumentation. Uh, the only thing that was worse was it took a little longer to do the robotic arm surgery. Um, and now that we found is after you know, 15 to 20 cases that robotic arm time and manual knee time is very similar. Um, we're actually able to do this very efficiently um, and get patients out of the operating room quickly. Um, there's less blood loss uh, through the robotic arm uh, knee. Uh, there's lower pain scores um, with the robotic arm assisted uh, total knee. Um, and that continues uh, through the first week of the recovery. Uh, it's not perfect, there's still pain medicine involved, but there was also a quicker return of motion, fewer physical therapy visits, a lot of improvements as we move from manual instrumentation to robotic arm assisted total knee. Uh, where I trained Tom Kuhn was one of the inventors of minimally invasive total knee replacement. Uh, even he said that was a bit of a misnomer because it still is a real surgery. Uh, but the goals are the same and it's now become very popular around the country um, to sort of do this multimodal pain regimen and, and cut less soft tissue and have a less traumatic surgery so patients have a little quicker recovery. The idea is to perform early and exceptional analgesia so we try to make it so that you don't have to feel uh, anything around the time of the surgery. A low trauma surgery so we try to cut a minimal amount of things uh, to access the joint uh, and resurface the ends of the bone and then an early discharge and a rapid rehabilitation. So um, 20 years ago, patients stayed in the hospital for a week or two after a joint replacement. Uh, 10 years ago, it was three to five days. Um, and now the average is less than two days and usually overnight. And like I said, more and more patients are going home the same day. Uh, we did nine surgeries yesterday and six patients went home the same day uh, yesterday. We wanna prevent the bad effects from anesthesia. So uh, prevent, um, nausea, prevent uh, pain, uh, so I actually give you the anti-inflammatories the night before and the morning of. The spinal anesthetic helps you wake up and still be numb so that you're not waking up in an extreme amount of pain. And then they do an actual regional nerve block so that most patients feel pretty comfortable for the first 24 to 36 hours after the surgery, um, although that does wear off and uh, there are um, you know, expectations that people will need narcotics, although there are rare patients who just take Tylenol after the surgery uh, and do just fine. Um, we do a little capsular injection of some NEMI medicine. You do not have to be awake during the surgery. Um, you're able to sleep through that with some IV sedation. And then get patients up and moving, uh, work on range of motion. Uh, this is the same day of the surgery. Uh, get you up, get you moving. Um, we want to be careful not to do too much early because that can you know, increase the swelling and inflammatory response after the surgery. But we do want you to get up and walk and, and you know, get ready to go home. So. Um, you know, if you do stay overnight, that's okay. Um, like I said, more patients are going home the same day. Uh, and before you leave, you should be able to get in and out of bed on your own, go to the bathroom on your own, do stairs if you need to. So moving on to hips now, uh, as we've covered knees very thoroughly. First thing we talk about in, in hips is the bearing surface and how we choose what that is. A lot of different options for the bearing surface. So that's what the ball and, uh, liner is made of. So there's ceramic on ceramic. The most traditional was uh, metal on plastic. Uh, metal on metal was very popular 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, and then ceramic on plastic. Um, the idea is you want to find something that's durable, uh, something that doesn't have uh, side effects, and then allows motion for that femoral head to stay um, inside that cup without complications. Um, now I think the most common uh, implant combination that we use is ceramic on plastic. It has a very low wear rate, very low complication rate. Um, I think it allows for the best for all patients and so that's what we choose to use uh, for replacing that ball and cup in the hip. The minimally invasive surgical approach that I use for the hip replacement is direct anterior approach. Um, that's a incision up by the front. It allows us good access to the hip joint without detaching any muscles or tendons. We don't have to cut any muscles, don't have to cut any tendons. Uh, we're actually just able to spread between those, uh, access the joint, and replace the hip. Um, so I think this is a, a much less painful uh, procedure, a more stable procedure, and allows patients to recover faster. Um, so that's what this direct anterior approach means. In comparison to more traditional hip replacement, 
Um, it can be a little bit of a shorter incision. More traditionally, the incision is done on the side, um, and they go through the back and disturb the, the joint and connective tissues in the back, uh, a series of muscles called the short external rotators. When we go in through the front, we spread between those muscles, and we don't have to touch any um, tendons or uh, ligaments. This is why I do that approach. So. Um, it seems like it makes more sense to go between muscles, between nerves, uh, not have to detach anything or, or disrupt the joint um, to approach the joint for a primary uh, total hip. It's actually closer to the front of the body. Um, the hip is actually here in the groin if you look. This is a true surgical anatomy that, like I said, allows us to spread between muscles, to work on an intermuscular plane, to work on an internervous plane. Um, we don't have to detach any major muscles. Uh, there's no stabilizers that are removed. It's minimal risk to nerves. Uh, so I think this is as minimally invasive a surgery as that we can, we can come up with uh, for hip replacement. When they do a posterior approach, they do have to make a big incision and cut through these muscles over here. Um, and when we don't do that, uh, we think there's less pain, a quicker restoration of function, a shorter hospital stay, including same day discharge, um, less physical therapy, um, patients, less than half the patients need to go to formal physical therapy. Uh, so all this decreased the overall cost and economy um, of the surgery, uh, which is beneficial to the overall system and to you uh, for not having to you know, make co-pays that aren't needed or, and get back to work um, quicker, those kind of things. I think it's an, an ideal soft tissue interval. Uh, we do place you on this uh, crazy little table contraption that you see, but uh, patients are asleep. Laying in this position actually does make it easier to maneuver the body um, and perform the anesthesia. Uh, so it's an ideal uh, patient position and uh, makes it very easy for all involved. And then the instrumentation for the socket or the cup is, is very straightforward. Why doesn't everybody do it this way? Um, it's becoming more and more popular, especially around Boulder County and especially in Boulder. Um, but the exposure can be difficult um, if you're newer to this um, or haven't gone through uh, extensive training. Uh, then it's mainly the exposure of the thigh bone or the femur that causes the problems or issues, and it does require some specialized equipment um, to do that. So um, this is the fastest growing approach uh, to the, the hip replacement, um, and I think it's definitely something that's here to stay. Here's how it's done. I'll kind of show you through this. Um, it does require some special instruments. Uh, we use these retractors to allow us exposure to the joint um, so that we can adequately see. Um, there's a special light that we use so that we can see into the hip joint. This uh, contraption we put you in is called the arch table and it acts as a, a retractor and leg positioner that doesn't get tired. That's very consistent, very reproducible. Um, so it allows us really good control during the time of surgery um, and very consistent uh, leg position. This is a video, the patient's head is on the right, the feet are on the left, um, showing where we're gonna make this incision just below sort of the, the crest of the, the pelvis bone. Um, we're gonna avoid these nerves that they're labeling here as we move through. Um, then we're gonna cut through the, the soft tissue and move the muscles out of the way. There's one artery that gets in the way and so we make sure that we coagulate that on our way in. Um, and then we expose the hip joint. So uh, we place these retractors to spread between these muscles um, to get access to the joint. Um, and then we're gonna go ahead and open that hip joint up once we gain access. So by doing this, it helps to release the capsule, which increases the range of motion uh, after the surgery. Um, and so that's one of the goals of our surgery is to get rid of the pain initially from the arthritis and the bone on bone, uh, but also to increase the range of motion and, and stability with the patients. Um, take away any excess capsule that, that needs to be removed. Um, and then we prepare for our, our neck cuts and saw cuts. So uh, we actually uh, cut the femoral uh, head off uh, in situ um, and then remove that. Um, luckily this is a cartoon and, and not overly graphic with, with blood or anything kind of squirting around. Um, I know it's just after dinner, so I apologize for a little bit of surgical videos going on. We remove that femoral head, um, and then we're gonna turn our attention to the cup. So uh, we place a retractor in the front over the uh, acetabulum and posterior. Um, we remove the labrum that's around the hip joint, and then bring in a sort of a, we call a reamer uh, to sort of freshen up the bone. So we remove the hard arthritic uh, bone from the hip joint, and then place a metal cup and a plastic liner to act as our new cup and bearing surface. And then we turn our attention to the thigh bone or femur, and this is the most difficult part of the case. And so where that arch table helps in positioning the leg, rotating the leg, uh, we place our retractors uh, in the correct position so that we can gain exposure here. And then the big part is we need to do a release here on the um, 
the capsule so we can access and elevate this joint. So um, once we've elevated the joint into the correct position, we can enter into the, the femoral canal um, and do our preparation of the bone for our stem. So um, there's a lot more sort of carpentry or woodwork that goes into this than, than we like to admit. Um, but once we find the right stem uh, for the patient, we can then trial and, and put on trial components, a trial neck and a, a trial ball liner. Um, and then we can actually test and reduce the patient um, and get x-rays in a position to make sure that we have the correct size for the, the components, that they're in the right position, um, and that we have the right parts for the right patient. Once this is uh, in place, then we go ahead um, and lower the, the thigh bone back into position. Um, we actually don't use this hook anymore, um, so that's a little bit of a, an outdated uh, slide. Um, but as we move the camera here, you can see all the muscles that remain attached during the surgery. So over here are these muscles that are removed in a posterior approach, these short external rotators that add stability. And that's a big reason why it's more stable doing an anterior approach as opposed to a posterior approach, so it reduces your risk for dislocation. So there are typically precautions after a surgery. Um, in a posterior approach, uh, they don't want you to cross your legs or bend more than a right angle or 90 degrees, point your toe inward. They often make you sleep on your back with a pillow between your legs. We do the direct anterior approach. We don't have any limitations on that uh, manner. Uh, we let you get up, move around. There's no restrictions on your sleeping position. Um, the only position we don't want you to get in is to move your leg all the way out to the side, rotate it, and then come back behind you. Um, but people rarely do that. Um, and so, and then after six weeks, the risk for dislocation goes down dramatically. Benefits for an anterior approach, uh, I think it decreases the hospital stay. Like I said, we're getting more and more patients going home the same day. Um, if they're not, they're going home the next day. Uh, quicker rehabilitation with just doing exercise at home and not having to go to physical therapy. Smaller incision, reduced muscle disruption, um, helps for the less scarring, quicker recovery time. Um, less blood loss, it's a very quick surgery, um, half hour, 45 minutes. Um, and then reduce post-operative pain. It's very common that patients just take Tylenol after the surgery, um, although we do give you some, narcotic, you know, some narcotic pain medicine and some muscle um, relaxers uh, to help with muscle spasms because while we don't cut the muscles, we're not very nice to them as we pull them out of the way. The risk of dislocation is definitely reduced from an anterior approach. Um, and I think all this combined by not cutting muscles, um, just spreading between the muscles allows for a more natural return to, to function and activity. So I think this overall is better for patients, uh, reduces the need for hip precautions. The only thing with uh, yoga that we have is we don't want you to, we just want you to cheat a little bit on warrior two, and instead of pointing your foot backwards as far as you can, just to point that forwards. Um, and we have improved control over where we're putting these components. To really sort of maximize and optimize our control of the, putting those components in place, uh, we do use technology in the hip replacement as well. Um, the robotic arm uh, with Mako helps with that as well. It gives us increased level of precision in the planning um, and then in the execution. Um, so we have confidence in our component position. Uh, we still do take fluoroscopic images during the surgery, but there can be some um, parallax that occurs with those that may not give as accurate um, information as we want. And so the computer navigation and robotic assist really helps with that. And overall, just tend to optimize our surgical results because you know, the recovery room and, and when we get our final x-ray is a little too late to make any changes. So we want to do anything we need to change at the time of surgery um, and really sort of optimize those results. Why do we want to do that? So this is a, a big study that came out a few years ago uh, from the Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, they actually looked at almost 2,000 surgeries um, from all their uh, specialists. And the Massachusetts General Hospital is a, considered an excellent you know, hip center of excellence uh, for hip replacement. And they found that they were accuracy in placing the cup in the right position was about 50% um, with even high volume surgeons and low volume surgeons was even worse. Uh, and their accuracy was even worse if they did a minimally invasive approach or, or had a patient that was obese. So um, the square that you see over here um, is not the target or the bullseye. It's the paper that the target's pointed on. So really our target is in here. Um, and half of these dots outside are inaccurate cup placements and, and can cause difficulty down the road with wear or instability. 
So with robotic arm technology, we were able to plan better. Um, when they were doing this study, they did two-dimensional planning of a three-dimensional object. Now we can get the CT scan and get a three-dimensional image um, and plan directly off that three-dimensional image so we can optimize that cut position for each patient. We get information about the femoral side as well so we can make adjustments um, based on what we think we're gonna end up on the femoral side. We can actually take the hip through a virtual range of motion to show the results of the surgery um, before we perform the surgery to allow us to make any changes. Um, really allows us to dial this in. Uh, and so this has been shown in a study. Um, so Dr. Rich Ilgen uh, did this study at the University of Wisconsin. Um, this is that same Massachusetts general uh, study where 40% were, or 50% were in the box. And here we're at 96% were in the target zone. And then 95% were within four degrees of plan. And the ones that were outside of this target zone um, were actually planned to be outside of the target zone because of the patient's individual anatomy and what fit best for that particular patient. Um, so it really allows us to be very accurate and very consistent with our, our cup placement with this robotic arm total hip. Um, there's been a lot of studies where people trying to actually prove that um, they didn't need to have the robot. So Dr. Dome, who is the mentor of uh, Dr. Chen, who's one of my partners, did a study trying to prove that he didn't need to, to use a, a robotic arm assisted surgery. Um, and he ended up with 100% in the safe zone for his robotic arm surgery and 80% in the safe zone when he was just doing manual instrumentation. So uh, even when he was trying his absolute best, he still wasn't as good as the, the robotic arm surgeries for this. So this safe zone helps to prevent uh, dislocation, impingement, and optimize the cup position for wear um, with our goal of trying to make these implants last as long as we can. So combining this technology with the technique of direct interior approach, um, I think it really gives us the best of both worlds and really try to give the top-notch uh, surgical outcome for all the patients. Our goal of all joint replacement surgery is pain relief. Um, secondarily, we want to restore the function and lifestyle, optimize the patient outcomes, and then finally do it in an economic fashion. So um, while it seems odd to talk about an expensive robot and then say economics, there's actually been studies shown that by reducing the need for subsequent surgeries with the um, robotic arm technology that actually saves money in the long run uh, for the institution and for the overall uh, medical community. When we're doing these direct anterior approaches, similar to the total knees, we want to do this early uh, analgesia, a low trauma surgery, so we don't want to damage the muscles while we're pulling on them, um, and then get you up, get you moving, uh, get you back home. Again, similar to the knee, uh, prevent the bad effects, so uh, prevent nausea, uh, preemptive analgesia, so we really want to try to prevent you from having a big inflammatory response to this. We do an injection around the capsule, and, and again, you sleep through it. You want to be sedated so you don't have to be awake for the surgery. Um, and then we go in and, and replace that joint. Get you up, get you moving. Um, ideally, ambulation the same day, sometimes discharge home the same day on an individual patient basis and on your desires. This is uh, the first patient I did uh, hip replacement on in Boulder. Um, he'd actually fallen and broken his hip um, while he was skiing. Uh, he was 80 years old, uh, and after he was fixed, he uh, did 10,000 miles on his bike in the first 18 months after his hip replacement. Um, we did his surgery in April, uh, and he was cresting Teton Pass uh, three months later, and then did a century ride uh, four months later. So obviously this is a very bolder patient, um, very active, uh, very healthy guy otherwise. Um, but you know, this is the kind of results we want to get you back to doing what you want to do. Surgery uh, does have risks. Um, these are include but not limited to bleeding, infection, damage to nerves and vessels. There's risk for blood clots. Blood clots go into your lungs. Rare things like stroke, heart attack, and death. Um, with hip replacements, there's also risk of dislocation. Uh, anytime we do surgery on bone, there's risk of breaking the bone. Uh, and then there's also risk of changing the length of the legs at the time of surgery. Often where you're trying to actually do that to optimize and match up to the other leg, uh, but we're not always exactly perfect. Uh, COVID is hopefully wrapping up um, here from a pandemic phase to a, a endemic phase, but we still have to discuss it because this is a medical talk. Um, we've actually been doing elective surgery for almost two years now um, since the initial shutdown, uh, March of 2020. Uh, we have no current plans to, to stop. Um, obviously, that could change uh, as the environment changes, and we, we do keep tabs on what overall is going on, but luckily, um, this latest surge seems to be receding, and the hospitalization numbers are dropping significantly. Um, so hopefully, we're through, finally, uh, the worst of all this. Um, we still do currently test patients pre-op uh, for COVID, um, and all the staff follow the proper um, PBE protocol. Um, so we try to make this as safe an experience for you uh, at the hospital and the surgery center um, so we can continue to 
take care of patients that, that don't have COVID uh, for, for joint replacement. At this time, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, I think Amy's been collecting some over there and, and she'll ask me some of those and we'll see where we go from there. Excellent, thank you so much. Very, very great presentation. We do have some questions that have come in and we will probably get a few more coming in in our time that we have left. Um, let's see, I'm gonna ask, I've kind of broken these up some into hip and knee, but one general question is, what is the cost for treatment if one does not have insurance? That's a good question. So what is the cost for treatment if this one does not have insurance? So. In general, I'd say most people have insurance. Um, in gen if they have insurance, then that usually covers the deductible um, and more so um, for that. And one of the reasons why we're busy at the beginning and the end of the year is people either want to hit their deductible or um, have hit their deductible, so they want to have, get the surgery done. Um, if it's Medicare, uh, it covers 80% and a supplement will cover the other 20 um, or they'll have 20% they need to cover. If you don't have insurance, um, there's negotiations that you can have um, with either the hospital or the surgery center um, on pricing. Um, don't hold me to it, but I think it's somewhere in the twenty-two dollars to $25,000 range for the hospital, of course. Um, that is, you know, 10 times more than what I get paid for these things. So uh, the hospital and the surgery center get the bulk of the, the fees that come from that, um, and then mine is um, substantially less, but still not nothing. Um, and so that's kind of the ballpark that it usually works out to. And you can negotiate um, with the hospital, the surgery center, and, and come up with pricing plans um, for that. Excellent. Um, if you need to have replacements on both knees, how much time do you recommend between the surgeries? That's a good question. So how much time do I recommend between surgeries? Um, I like the question because it acknowledges that I don't like to do both knees at the same time. Um, I think it's safer and patients have a better recovery if you do one knee and then the other knee. Um, often patients are ready to go back and do that at six weeks if they're healthy enough. If they're a little older or a little sicker, we like to wait at least three months. Um, but whether that's six weeks, six months, or six years is ultimately up, up to the patient. Um, but we've had a lot of patients that have had one knee done and then come back six weeks later and have the other knee done or six weeks later and have the other hip done. Um, so that's a pretty good uh, mar uh, mark for that. And then. We stretch that out if they're a little older or a little less healthy to three months. Excellent, good. Um, a similar question, can a hip and a knee replacement be done at the same time if they're on the same side of the body? Uh, can a hip and a knee replacement be done at the same time on the same person in the same leg? Um, it physically can be performed. Um, I would not recommend it um, for sure. I think the mo if they were both needing to be done and both hurting the same, we'd start probably with the hip replacement and then six weeks later do the knee replacement. Um, I think doing two surgeries on the same limb like that um, in the same setting uh, really increases your risk for complications um, and really decreases your mobility for after the surgery. Um, and so I really think you would handicap your recovery. There's a lot more physical therapy that goes into a knee replacement than a hip replacement. Um, and so you'd hate to have to try to divide that up or, or have your knee recovery limited because you're still recovering from your hip or vice versa. And so while physically it can be done, I highly recommend against it. Right, right. Does Medicare, I mean, excuse me, Medicaid pay for any of this, do you know? Uh, Medicaid pays for the surgery. Um, with uh, Medicaid, we, it's a little hit and miss whether they pay for the CT scan that's needed for the, um, for the robotic arm portion of the, the surgery. Um, if a patient really wants to, um, we can try to run it through Medicaid and see if it gets paid for. Um, if it doesn't, then the patient has the option to pay for that out of pocket, um, which is a few hundred dollars. Um, and then you know, negotiate that with the hospital. Um, or if they're not able to, to do the CT scan, um, then we just do it with manual instrumentation. I see. Can you discuss the materials used for complete knee replacement? Stainless steel versus titanium versus plastic? Yeah. So with a, with a total knee replacement, uh, the vast majority of patients are done uh, where the, the cap on the thigh bone, the rounded part is made of cobalt chrome. Uh, the flat portion that goes on the shin bone uh, or the tibia is made of titanium. And then there's a special highly cross-linked polyethylene that goes in between um, and acts as the bearing surface. So it's actually metal on plastic. Um, there are 
different types of metals that can be used for the femur bone. Um, if a patient has an allergy to nickel, um, we will use something called oxinium, which is an oxidized uh, metal that's uh, ceramicized, so um, it doesn't have the nickel that we worry about um, in a cobalt chrome. Um, although there is some debate whether there's much truth to the knee allergy um, issue with knee replacement. Um, and so there's still a lot of debate as to how seriously to take that. Although I've definitely seen some patients who seem to have a very true allergy to nickel and have a, a nickel-containing implant. Um, and it definitely does not look like a, a good outcome. So if patients have a history of irritation from cheap jewelry or they have, you know, don't wear a lot of jewelry or have irritation from metals. Um, we do have a test that we can do to test them for that allergy to nickel. Um, but vast majority of patients um, get cobalt chrome and titanium. There's no stainless steel uh, knee implants that are out there. Excellent. As well as Tylenol, ibuprofen, heat, ice, et cetera, the rice that you mentioned, are there exercises to strengthen the knee area to delay yeah. surgery? There, are there exercises to help strengthen that knee area? I think there's a lot of good ones. Um, bicycling can be very helpful um, because it's not as impact. Um, it still allows you to strengthen with some of the resistance. Um, you want to try to avoid stairs, lunges, deep squats, those kind of things. Um, but we want you to get out and walk and try to, to build up muscle that way. Um, just be careful of inclines and declines. But flat ground walking is usually very good. Uh, bicycling is good. And then water aerobics type exercises can be good as well. Excellent. Uh, do you have any information on, I'm going to try to say this right, genicular artery embolization for knee pain relief? Uh, I know that's, an, there's, so genicular artery embolization for knee pain uh, is sort of a newer um, experimental thing that's come out. So there's a lot of different blood supply to the knee, um, and there are attempts to embolize the, the vessel to um, decrease the pain around the knee joint. Um, there's some short-term data that shows maybe some potential um, in some studies uh, for that. You worry a little bit about decreasing the blood supply to, to the knee if you don't have to. Um, there are some instances after a knee replacement where there can be some excessive um, vasculature that can form, and sometimes we have to do this genicular artery embolization after the surgery. Uh, very rare, but um, that's how I know about it most specifically. Um, so I know that that is an option, but it's, it's kind of an extreme option to, to try to get sort of a short-term relief of the pain. Um, because you're still going to have the arthritis in the knee, you're still going to have the bone on bone, you're still going to have the inflammation. And it seems obvious, but I should say it, you can't remove all the blood supply to the knee because then it won't live or survive, and that will cause its own significant problems. Just like the knee question, someone has asked, could you suggest exercises before hip surgery? Uh, for hip surgery, very similar. Um, biking, um, if you can tolerate it, uh, walking is good. Um, you know, trying to avoid those high impact activities. Uh, swimming can be good. Um, so those are kind of the main ones for, for both hips and knees. They're, they're very similar exercises. And again, avoiding the deep squats and things like that. How long before one can return to a desk job at work after a complete knee replacement? how long before people can return to work after the knee replacement. So it depends on the job. So like a desk job, um, you know, two weeks is not out of the question. Um, you know, if it's a bit more demanding or a lot more standing, it could be four to six weeks. Um, if you have a whole bunch of time built up and you want to really kind of fully recover before you go back, um, you know, kind of 12 weeks is the most that we can sort of justify as having time off. But obviously more people want to get back to work sooner. Um, if you can work from home, I've had people that work from home the next week. Um, I had one guy that was working from the hospital bed the next day. Um, so, you know, th there's, depends on what your job situation is and what that looks like. And we tailor it to each individual person. So if you feel like you're ready to go back to your job, I'm not going to keep you from going back. Um, and I'm not going to force you to go back if you're not ready. How much physical therapy is done with a partial knee replacement? How and much? I guess physical therapy across the board, uh, do you recommend that and how much? And, okay. Yeah. So it's a good question. How much physical therapy after the joint replacements? So um, with the total knee replacements, we recommend it for everybody. Um, we send everybody for a month. You know, some people need more, some people need less. 
Uh, with the partial knee replacement, similar, we recommend it for everybody. Um, although there's some data out there suggesting that partial knee replacements don't really need a whole lot of therapy uh, because it does sort of recover a lot quicker than a total knee. Um, and then with the total hips, we try to just let them recover for three to six weeks after the surgery um, and then decide if they need physical therapy after that. Um, and I'd say 20 to 30% of patients need physical therapy uh, after the hip replacement. Um, so much less from that. Mostly we just want people to walk, kind of recover, um, you know, do the exercises. But there are instances where therapy is very helpful uh, after the surgery, uh, but it's less common after a hip. I see. What is the expected range of motion after total knee replacement? I think you mentioned that, but you can remind that. Remind oh, yeah, so the, the expected range of motion. So uh, the true answer is it kind of depends on where you start. Um, so if you don't have great motion before the surgery, we try to increase that and get that to be better. Um, but you're not going to go from not being able to bend your knee fully to being able to bring your heel all the way to your butt. It's just not physically possible with the soft tissue. Um, so we try to increase it. In general, for sort of a generic answer, um, normal is about 120, 125 for our flexion, um, although we do have patients who get more than that. Um, the box on the implant says 150 is sort of the max of motion, although I've seen more than that. Um, I've seen less than that at two uh, because patients start with a stiffer knee. So um, it depends on the starting point, um, but usually patients can get about what they started with, sometimes a little bit more, rarely a little less. Uh, about hip uh, replacement now, a little bit more into those questions. Um, would this surgery help on someone who, with current chronic pain and two previous hip replacements years ago? Uh, so this surgery work on sort of chronic pain with previous hip replacements? Uh, it would depend on what the cause for the pain was um, and what the status of the hip replacements were. Um, you can do revision surgeries from an anterior approach, but it's much more limited indications for doing that. Um, so you want to make sure that, that the patient meets that indication. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for majority of cases that need to have a lot of work on the femoral side, it's usually a little safer uh, to do a posterior approach for that type of revision surgery. Um, but you know, it would depend on an individual basis, so it's tough to tell um, specifically here. Uh, does having osteoporosis complicate the hip replacement procedure? Uh, does having osteoporosis complicate the procedure? I'm more cognizant of that. Uh, the vast majority of my patients have some level of osteopenia and the females some level of osteoporosis just because the average age is 67, 68 that goes through these joint replacements. So um, it's very common that they have some bone density issues. Um, we pay attention to it. If it's severely bad, um, we have different implants that we can use or we can even cement the component in place. Uh, but in general, we have um, good stability and good success rates with having the bone grow onto the implant. Um, and that seems to work very well. So we're cognizant of it, but it usually doesn't impact things negatively. How long are the robotic hip replacements lasting at this point? How long are the robotic hip replacements lasting at this point? That's a good question. Um, so it's only been out robotics for 10 years for the hip replacement, 15 years for the partial knee, and, and five years for the total knee. Um, there's very good success in long-term data um, showing you know, far less than 1% failure rate at 10 years. Um, but you know the, the longer-term data with the hip is more concern of early um, instability issues, leg length issues. Um, you know, the wear issues take longer to show up. Um, the newer plastics that we've sort of changed to in the last 15 uh, to 20 years um, are showing such minimal wear um, that I, it's going to be tough to show a difference with robotics as far as the wear goes and how long they last. Uh, but there's definitely studies showing reduced risk of dislocation, reduced risk for revision, reduced risk for leg length discrepancy um, when using these robotic arm assisted surgeries. I, I, I think you've an, uh, answered this, but I'm going to ask it because two people have asked this question. How soon can you resume? Hi resume hiking or cycling after total or partial knee replacement? How long, how soon can you resume that? Um, so I tell patients uh, for, you know, hiking, biking, those kind of things. Uh, most people are able to walk a mile by about a month after surgery. 
Um, I have had patients that walked a mile the day after surgery. I do not recommend that. Um, that is a little bit over, overdoing it and can lead to some swelling and issues uh, for the remainder of the week. Um, there is that honeymoon period while the block still works, so we try not to have you overdo it. Um, but you know, a mile by a month is usually a pretty good goal, um, especially by that six weeks after. And most people are able to get on a bike um, you know, around that time as well to at least get on a stationary bike and feel comfortable um, and then hopefully get outside shortly thereafter. This guest says, I have a labral tear. Can that be repaired without hip replacement? Uh, an isolated labral tear with no arthritis um, can be repaired um, with a arthroscopic procedure. My partner, Dr. Chen, does sort of hip preservation procedures with uh, hip arthroscopy and, and those kind of things. And so um, if it's an isolated labral tear, I usually refer over to him uh, for treatment for that. Um, what they found, I think, is that <clears throat> most patients um, do well with physical therapy and injection and often don't need surgery for the labral tear. Um, but if it does need surgery, he would be the, the one to talk to. All righty, here we go with this one. Why do anterior hip replacements have an incision on the non-surgical side? Mm. So uh, the anterior hip replacements um, don't all have an incision on the non-operative side. The incision on the non-operative side, say if we're doing a left hip, so we're making the approach on the left side. Um, when we're doing the robotic arm assisted, we actually put pins on the crest on the opposite hip. So we make little poke holes on the other side to put pins in so that we can track the, the pelvis throughout the surgery. And that's how we can uh, use the robotic arm assisted during that time. So um, that's a good question. Uh, and that's why that there, it's not because of the anterior approach so much as it is the robotic arm assisted portion of that. Um, interesting question. Does doing a hip replacement improve pain in the knee? Does doing a hip replacement improve pain in the knee? Actually, it can. Uh, so there is a nerve that runs from the hip down to the knee. And I have had patients who swore they needed to have their knee replaced or had already had their knee replaced um, from previous arthritis who then developed knee pain later. Um, and it turned out that their hip had worn out. So uh, there is actually some pain relief from the knee um, from getting the hip replaced uh, if there's not anything actually wrong with the knee. You are allowed to have a hip and a knee wear out, so they both need to be replaced. Um, but there is, uh, are patients that have hip arthritis that causes knee pain mm -hmm. that goes away after a hip replacement. Um, specifically, are there any joint pain management brands or companies that you prefer as a surgeon? Uh, um, specific to? Uh, any brands or companies for joint pain management? I guess over the counter, anything in uh, Like over the counter pain relievers? Um, yeah. Really, I mean, I get my pain relievers from Costco, so in the giant bottle. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I think the generic stuff is as good as the, the name brand stuff. Um, ultimately, it's up to, um, to whatever you prefer, um, you know, and what the cost looks like to do that. But I don't think there's a big difference between name brand or, or generic at this point. Okay. Um, is there such a thing as a partial hip replacement? Uh, is there such a thing as a partial hip replacement? There is. Um, it's called a hemiarthroplasty, um, and it's when they just replace the ball side of the hip. Um, that is usually reserved for older patients who've had a hip fracture where they fracture the ball off um, from the femoral neck. Um, and then rather than do a full hip replacement, they just do a half a hip replacement or the hemiarthroplasty. Um, the risk with that is that then you have metal that's wearing against cartilage, and that can wear out long term. Uh, and so, you know, there, there are indications for that for sure, um, but they're becoming less uh, prevalent. Um, they may be referring to a hip resurfacing, which is where they put a cap on the bone, uh, the ball, and then put a cup in uh, as well. Um, that has metal on metal on it, which I'm not a big fan of because of the risk of metal ions that can form and, and the failure from that. The indications of that have narrowed greatly. I know my uh, former partner who recently retired, Dr. Rector, did a lot of hip resurfacings, um, and he had very good success rates with that. Um, but I feel that the reasons that people do resurfacings um, 
aren't necessarily benefits compared to an anterior approach, and the risk of the metal on metal, in my opinion, is high enough that I don't do those. Um, if patients meet the indications, which is usually younger males um, who need their hips replaced, uh, my partner, Dr. Chen, does hip resurfacings, um, and so I would refer you to him to have that discussion. What is the length of bone growth into the device? I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing the length of time to grow onto the device. So, no, what is the length of bone growth? What is the uh, amount of bone growth? Uh, I'm wondering if it's just the length of time it takes for the bone to grow on. That's what I'm going to answer because I don't know the other answer. Um, the <laughs> bone does grow onto the implants. Um, they're hydroxyapatite coated uh, implants where the bone grows onto that. Um, but there, it doesn't grow into a huge amount. Um, it's microscopic, but it covers the entire uh, surface of the, the implant to grow onto. Um, the time that it takes to do that uh, length of time is about eight to 12 weeks in general. So it's usually pretty well grown in by six to eight weeks and fully grown in by about 12 weeks. So that's why we try to avoid more dangerous activities like skiing or horseback riding or motorcycle riding or those kind of things until we're further out from surgery so that the, the bone's fully grown on there. All right. Well, uh, there are only a couple of more questions that have come in, so I'll ask you these and I'll ask our audience to um, go ahead and type in their questions if they have any that they're uh, holding on to right now. Um, are NSAIDs essential before surgery? Uh, are NSAIDs essential before surgery? Yeah. Not necessarily. Um, so obviously some people have allergies or uh, can't take the medications. And so there are certain patients that we don't give the NSAIDs to before surgery or they can't tolerate the NSAIDs prior to deciding to have surgery. Um, so it's not necessarily essential, but they, they can be helpful um, in the short term. Excellent. All right, well, like I say, I'm gonna wait another couple minutes for some questions to come in. Um, but uh, there is an interesting question about a rotator cuff. Are there robot-assisted surgeries for rotator cuffs? Uh, there's not a ro robotic-assisted surgery for the rotator cuff. I know they are working on the robotic arm-assisted surgeries for shoulder replacement and ankle replacement, and I think they're getting close to those. They're also working on you know, robotic arm-assisted surgeries for ACL reconstructions and some of those things. But as of right now, I'm not aware of anything for rotator cuff um, surgery at this point. Um, but there's a lot of people who are a lot smarter than I am working in rooms to come up with applications for the robot. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, I will ask, while well, we're just gonna wait one more minute for some, a couple more questions to come in. Um, how do I get in to see you? Do I uh, need to have a provider referral to come to see you? Do I um, just call you directly so for an appointment? It depends on the insurance. So usually you can just call directly um, or go to the, the Boulder Center for Orthopedics website and it's spelled uh, center RE instead of ER because um, we're fancy old English that way. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, there's online appointments that you can schedule. You can call to get an appointment to schedule. Um, if your insurance does require a prior authorization, you can ask the front desk um, people um, about that and they can work to help you get the, the referral if you need it. Um, but I would say the vast majority of people don't need any kind of referral. They just need to call in and, and make an appointment or, or go online and make an appointment as well. Uh, let's see, okay. Uh, is there any evidence that supplements can be used to delay hip surgery? Uh, there's not a lot of great evidence that supplements um, can help delay surgery. Uh, there are anti-inflammatory things like turmeric, which can help to sort of decrease the inflammation around the joint. Um, there's, you know, like I talked about, glucosamine and chondroitin, which um, theoretically has some benefit um, for that, but in large population studies doesn't seem to bear out on a population level. Uh, but on an individual level, it may help delay things. Um, but unfortunately, once the joint starts to wear out, it usually just continues to kind of wear out. After total knee, uh, can you do work on, uh, do work on your knees or crawl on the floor with kids, 
uh, on your knees. Well, Can you a, really I mean, go back to using your knees? It's a good question. So you're allowed to kneel on them. It does feel a little weird. So where we make the incision, there can be a little bit of numbness lateral to the incision. Um, that usually shrinks with time, but it may never completely go away. Uh, and so while it may feel weird, you are allowed to do it. Um, and a lot of people wear like a knee pad if they have to work on their knees or do something like that. Um, uh, guest, we have a guest that said, so you mentioned one mile at one month, then what time frame to do more? Um, then it's kind of, once you do kind of hit that mile at a month, if you're doing okay, it's kind of gradually increasing from there. Um, you know, we have patients that sometimes do, you know, two or three miles by, uh, six to eight weeks. Um, we also have patients who are just trying to still get to that mile. Um, it also depends on where you start. So um, if you weren't walking a mile beforehand, um, you're not going to be walking a mile at a month afterwards. Um, but, you know, because of the limitation and building up the strength and endurance, um, you know, it takes 12 weeks for the soft tissue to heal. So that's when we tell people that'll be about 90%, uh, six weeks, 60%. Um, and then that last 10%, you know, takes six to 12 months to kind of get the full improvement, build up the strength and endurance uh, to get the full benefit from the surgery. What is the rate of infection for hip replacement? Uh, rate of infection for hips and knees is both less than 1%. So um, we've been very lucky uh, with that. Um, obviously not zero, um, and it does happen from time to time, but it is less than less than 1%. Uh, do you know if you have to be in state to request an appointment? Uh, we have uh, programs where we talk to people outside of the state. Um, I have uh, patients that come down from Montana, uh, a guy from Alaska. Um, you know, we have people from all over the country. So um, we do do a scenario where we can review your films and have a virtual or a telehealth uh, visit and have that discussion. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be in the same state to, to have that conversation. Is knee replacement possible if you have low, blo low bone density? Uh, is knee replacement possible with low bone density? Yep, it is possible. Um, in that case, we probably just would cement the components in place um, if the bone was softer. But like I said, the majority of my patients have some level of low bone density. Mm -hmm. How far out are you scheduling? Uh, so we are scheduling for clinic. I know there's appointment slots open next week. Um, for that, uh, for actual surgery time, um, it can be anywhere from a month to two months, depending on the time of year, uh, to get in. And sometimes there's some scattered cancellations or reschedulings or something that comes up. So, uh, but in general, sort of a month or two is kind of the, the default for surgery. And we can get you in sooner um, to have a clinic visit for an evaluation. All right, I'm gonna wait for another question or two to come in. In the meantime, are you the, I have a question, are you the only one at your practice who does the uh, robotic arm assisted? No, so um, I'm not the only one that does the robotic arm assisted surgeries. So um, I do by far the most uh, hip and knee replacements uh, in Boulder uh, and by far the most robotic arm assisted surgeries in Boulder, but there's many of my partners that also do robotic arm assisted surgeries and direct anterior approach hip replacement. Um, Dr. Chen, Dr. Bowman, Dr. Voss, Dr. Dolbert. Um, so there's a lot of people that you can talk to. Um, and you know, try to find the person that's the best fit for you. Um, there was a, a next door post that was talking about recommendations for, for knee surgeries and they were all listing you know, very qualified people in the area. We're lucky to live in an area where there's a lot of very qualified, very dedicated uh, physicians and surgeons. Um, then you can have excellent um, outcomes um, without having to travel um, out, of the, out of the county. Do, uh, do you know if you require antibiotics after knee surgery before dental work? This is a great one, and I hope that there's still dentists paying attention. So after you have your joint replaced, there's been huge studies that have been done now. You do not need to have antibiotics after a hip or knee replacement prior to dental work, unless you have a history of a joint infection, are immunocompromised, or have diabetes. So um, please spread this around to your dentist friends there you do not need a note from your surgeon. It is a new update uh, from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Dental Association. You do not need to have antibiotics prior to your dental procedure. Unless what, what Unless things? you have a history of a joint infection, are immunocompromised, or have diabetes. Thank you. Is there an age that you're not recommended a total knee replacement since it only lasts 15 years? Uh, well, I mean, I, so first, 
part of that. I think that there's a 90% chance that it lasts 20 years and a good chance that it lasts 30 uh, for the length of time. Um, obviously, we try to prolong uh, the knee as long as we can in younger patients. So, um, but we have done knee replacements in patients in their 40s, I think a couple even in their 30s. Ideally, we try to push for a partial knee in those younger patients if we can, uh, but if we can't and we need to do a total knee replacement, then we need to do that. Um, you know, we don't know exactly what the future holds um, as far as that goes. Uh, and so, you know, we want, we don't want patients to suffer and sort of put up with it if they don't have to. Um, on the other side of the coin, you know, we have patients in their 90s that get joint replacements as well. Um, and so we don't have an upper limit, we don't have a lower limit, um, but we do try to have conversations and make sure that we've exhausted all non-operative measures um, before we do surgery on those sort of extreme age ranges. All right, I think this will be our last one. Uh, this guest asks, how long again does knee surgery take in the surgery center? Uh, how long does knee surgery take in the surgery center? So whether it's at the surgery center or the hospital, the length of the surgery is about the same. So my portion is about 30 to 40 minutes, you know, making the incisions and doing the cuts and putting in the new parts and, and sewing things up. Um, and then, you know, but the whole sort of dog and pony show with anesthesia and setting up the room and taking down the room is about an hour and a half um, at both places. So. Um, the actual time you're under surgery and doing surgery is in probably 45 minutes plus or minus. Uh, do you give blood thinners after knee replacement? So we do do things to help prevent blood clots uh, and you know PEs, pulmonary embolus. So uh, most patients get an aspirin uh, morning and night, a little baby aspirin for three uh, for a month. Um, Alternatively, if patients have a higher risk or a history of blood clots or have family history of blood clots or a, a genetic predisposition of blood clots, we do some more aggressive um, anticoagulation. But in general, our main uh, go-to anticoagulant is, uh, is just aspirin. Excellent. All right then, well, I'm gonna scoot right here to the front and talk to our guests and say, we have come to the end of our time tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Blackwood, so much for your time and expertise uh, presenting this information to us tonight. Uh, a recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. You'll find a lot of, uh, all of our lectures archived there. Um, and you will also receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill out this survey. And um, again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccination and boosters. And uh, again, thank you, Dr. Blackwood, and thank you all for joining us tonight, and have a good night. Thank you.